Welcome to the Chemistry, Biology and Math Revision Hub. Today we are doing the Pearsonet Excel International Level Chemistry Unit 4 for June 2022. This is the Part 3 video. I'll put the links to the Part 1 and Part 3 video below the description box. Let us begin with question 19. Question 19 says this question is about methanoic acid and propanoic acid. A student carried out a titration to find the concentration of aqueous solution or potassium hydroxide. So they say 25 centimeters cubed of 0.150 mole per decimeter cubed. Aqueous methanoic acid was pipetted into a conical flask. Potassium hydroxide was added from a burette while measuring the pH. The titration curve is produced here. We can see the titration curve. So here they say, complete the equation for the reaction taking place in this titration. State symbols are not required. So here we have methanoic acid reacting with potassium hydroxide this is an acid-base reaction, and we know a salt which is potassium methanoate is going to be produced in water, so that is the equation for the reaction. Continuing on here, they say, calculate the concentration of potassium hydroxide solution using your equation in one and the titration curve. So again, I wrote this equation here, and then I wrote the information below. From here, we can see they gave us the information up here that this is the volume and the concentration of methanoic acid use, so I went with that. We see the volume here and the concentration. And then from the graph, we can see the neutralization occurred at 22 centimeters cubed. You can see that is where we have the vertical line. It was a 22 centimeters cubed of potassium hydroxide. Since you can see this is the volume of potassium hydroxide. So I noted that. So the volume for this is that. Since I have this information, I can work out the number of moles. Moles of methanoic acid equal to concentration times volume, which is 0 0.15 times 25 over 1,000. I divided by 1,000 to convert this to decimeters cubed. So we get that. Now, since the mole ratio is 1 to 1, it means the moles of potassium hydroxide are also going to equal to that, as displayed here. So we have the number of moles, we have the volume, we can work out the concentration of potassium hydroxide, which is equal to number of moles over volume. The number of moles are here, the volume in decimeters cubed is here, and I get 0 0.1704545, which is rounded off to 0 0.170 mole per decimeter cubed to three significant figures. Moving on, here they say use the titration curve to determine a value for the acid dissociation constant Ka of methanoic acid. So let me take you back to the graph. We know that the pH at half neutralization should equal to the pKa. So if this is 22 centimeters cubed, it means at 11 centimeters cubed, I need to read off the pH from that graph, which is 3.8. That is going to equal to my pKa. So displaying it back here, I say as half neutralization, pH is equal to pKa. Since this from the graph is 3.8, it means pKa should equal to 3.8. However, I know pKa is the same as negative log of Ka. If it's equal to 3.8, it means my Ka is going to be equal to that, which is 1.58489 times 10 power negative 4. Part B says a student prepared a buffer by mixing together equimolar aqueous solution of propanoic acid and sodium propanoid. They say the acid dissociation constant Ka for propanoic acid is that calculate the volume ratio of propanoic acid to sodium propanoid needed to produce a buffer solution with a pH of 4.6. So I began by converting. Remember they gave us the pH. I wanted to convert this into the hydrogen ion concentration. So if pH is 4.6, negative log of hydrogen ion concentration should be 4.6. And therefore, the concentration of hydrogen should be 10 power negative 4.6, which gave me that mole per decimeter cubed. And then I wrote my equation for the reaction taking place between the acid as well as the salt and the hydrogen. Now, from here, I know that my Ka should be the concentration of that times the concentration of that divided by the concentration of that. Making this the subject, hydrogen ion concentration should equal to that times that divided by that, which I have displayed here. Then finally, I substituted in the values. I know the hydrogen ion concentration from here. I've calculated it. The question gave me the Ka value from here. You can see that is it. So substituting in this, I got the ratio of the concentration of the acid to the concentration of the salt. So concentration of the acid to the salt is the same as that divided by that, which is displayed here. And it gave me 1.93222. So the ratio of that to that is 1 to 1.9. 32222. Now, when we go back to the question, they said they mixed equimolar. So if they mix the same number of moles, it means 
there is going to be the same concentration in the same volume. So here I said, so the volume ratio of the acid to the salt is also 1 to 1 1.9, 3 to 2. So this brings us to the end of question 19. Let's continue to question 20. Question 20, this question is about the hydrolysis of 2 bromobutane with aqueous sodium hydroxide at 298 Kelvin. The equation for the reaction is given here. So they say the data shown were obtained in an experiment to investigate the kinetics of this reaction. So they gave us a question here. They say, deduce the order of reaction with respect to 2 bromobutane and with respect to the hydroxide ions and justify your answer. So the first part, I looked at the experiment 1 and 2. When you compare experiment 1 and 2, please look at everything in purple. Experiment 1 and 2, we can see that as the concentration of these doubles, keeping this constant, we see the rate also doubles, meaning it should be first order with respect to that. When you consider the things in green, looking at experiment 1 and 3, we can see that as the concentration of this one here remains constant while that doubles, the rate of reaction remains unchanged, that means it's going to be zero order with respect to the OH minus. So here I said, from the experiment 1 and 2, doubling the concentration of 2 bromobutane where that of the OH ions remain constant leads to the doubling of the initial rate. So it's going to be first order with respect to 2 bromobutane. Also from experiment 1 and 3, keeping the concentration of 2 bromobutane constant while doubling that of OH leads to no change in the initial rate. So it's zero order with respect to OH minus. Down here, they say write the right equation for the reaction using your answer in A1. Rate is equal to K concentration of that, which is 2 bromobutane, or you could write it as that. The reason for this is, remember this is order 1, but the other should be power 0, so that disappears. It just leaves us with the rate is equal to K concentration of the bromobutane. Moving on. Here they say calculate the rate constant for experiment 1 and include units in your answer. Remember, we have the rate equation already. Rate is equal to K into the concentration of bromobutane. So you go to experiment 1 and get the initial rate as well as the concentration of bromobutane and fit them into this equation in order to find the value of K. So let me take you back to that. In experiment 1, we can see 2 bromobutane. That is the concentration. And this is going to be the initial rate. So I'm going to fit this value and that value into the rate equation. So the rate is that. The value of the concentration of 2 bromobutane is that, making K the subject, I got this. Please remember the units are going to be per second since this is going to be mole per decimeter cube per second, and that is mole per decimeter cube, so we get per second as the left unit. So here they say draw the mechanism for the reaction that is consistent with your rate equation. Include curly arrows and any relevant dipoles and lone pairs of electrons. The key thing here we can see is since the rate equation only has the 2 bromobutane, it means this mechanism went through SN1, meaning only the bromobutane was present in the rate determining step. So here I went through that pathway. So if it went through SN1, it means the Br leaves before the other nucleophile comes, creating a positively charged carbon, or you could call it a carbocation. So when we produce a carbocation, the bromide is going to be broken off, so you have to show the Br- minus on the other side. Then in the next step, the OH, which is the second nucleophile, is going to attack the carbocation as we produce the product which we're interested in. This is going to be the alcohol that is produced. So this brings us to the end of question 20. Let's continue to question 21. Question 21. This question is about oxides of iron. The equation for the reduction of iron 3 oxide by carbon is shown. That is the equation. This is some data relating to this reaction as shown. Again, here they've given us the enthalpies of formation as well as the entropies for the reactants as well as the products. So the first question here says, calculate the standard enthalpy change of this reaction for the reduction of iron 3 oxide by carbon. To find the enthalpy change of this reaction, we have to get the total enthalpies of the product and the total enthalpies of the reactant and get the difference between the two. So this should be the summation of the enthalpies of the products minus the summation of the enthalpies of the reactants. So to get the enthalpies of the products, I will get 3 times the enthalpy of carbon monoxide, which is that, plus 2 times the enthalpy of iron, which is that. So I got this one here. And then the enthalpies of the reactants, I should get 1 times this one here, which is that, plus 
3 times 0, which is that. So it means this is going to be 0 and that is going to be 0. So whatever I remain with is going to be that times that minus that, which gave me positive 492.7 kilojoules per mole. Here they say calculate the entropy change, the H system, for this reaction. Again, to find the entropy change of the system, it should be the sum of the entropy of the products minus the sum of the entropy of the reactants. So the entropy of the products is going to be the entropy of these. So for that case, I'll say 3 times that plus 2 times that. That is giving me the total entropies of the products, as you can see here. And then the entropies of the reactants are going to be 3 times that plus 1 times that, which gave me the answer I have down here. So when I subtracted the two by fitting them into this equation, I got the answer to be positive 542.9 joules per Kelvin per mole. Please take care of the units of entropy and the units of enthalpy. They are different. This is kilojoules per mole. This is joules per Kelvin per mole. Moving on. The next part says calculate the temperature at which this reaction becomes feasible using your answer in A1 and A2. To be feasible, of course, we know total entropy change has to be positive. So ds total is equal to ds system plus ds surrounding. But since ds surrounding is going to be negative delta h over t, I just put it direct here. I put some information here. When equilibrium is reached, we know ds total is going to be zero, meaning at equilibrium there is feasibility. So for this reaction to be feasible, ds total should be equal to or greater than zero. So that is what I have to put here. So this one here should be equal to or greater than zero for that to be feasible. Now then I substitute it for the S system. This is what I have. For negative delta H over T, this is what I have. I multiply by 1000 because the enthalpy is in kilojoules per mole. So it, I had to convert this to joules by multiplying by 1000. So that minus that should be greater or equal to zero for feasibility to be established. Then I just have multiplied the T here to create that and took this the other side. I remained with uh, something you see here, which gave me 907.53 Kelvin. So T should be greater or equal to that for feasibility to be established. Part B says the equation for the reduction of iron 3 oxide by carbon monoxide is shown. That is the equation for the reaction. They say the entropy change, the S system theater for this reaction is that. Explain why the reaction should be feasible at any temperature. They say it feasible at any temperature. Again, to understand this fully, I say ds total should equal to ds system minus delta H over T. Now we know from this reaction, this is going to be an exothermic reaction. So this is going to be negative. So a negative times a negative creates a positive. And that means uh, the S surrounding is going to be positive. Yet we also know the S system is given to us as positive. So we are guaranteed that at any temperature, no matter what is going to be, since the delta H is negative, it makes this positive. Yet yeah, this is also positive. So this is guaranteed to be positive. So I say in this reaction, delta S system, which is positive 15.2 joule per mole per Kelvin is positive. The S surrounding is positive since delta H is negative. So the S total is positive and the reaction is going to be feasible. Down here, they say explain how an increase in temperature would affect the estoro of this reaction. No calculations are required. When we increase the temperature, this value here is going to be a smaller, but the magnitude of this is going to be small. Even if overall this is going to be positive because delta H is negative, but making the temperature so large will make this magnitude to be smaller. So it means overall we're going to get a little bit smaller value of the estoro. So here I said, Increasing the temperature would decrease the magnitude of the surrounding and the system will not be significantly changed. So the S total will become less positive. That is what you'll get. So lastly here they say iron also forms iron to oxide. The data in the table can be used to construct a bone harbor cycle for iron to oxide. So here they've given us the information. And then on the next page they say complete the bone harbor cycle by putting letters in the back says to label the energy changes. Here I put A because we can see here the iron solid is being converted into iron gas. That is atomization of iron and that is the value for that. Here we can see this is ionization of iron or you would say first ionization since this is being converted into an gaseous iron that is first ionization energy. This is second ionization energy of iron which is C. You can see from plus one to plus two. 
And from here to there, we can see this is atomization of oxygen. So this is going to be H. From here, we can see oxygen gains minus one charge. So this is going to be first electron affinity of oxygen. And then from here, we can see from minus one to minus two, that is second electron affinity of oxygen. And finally, we can see these gaseous ions being converted into a solid that is the lattice energy. And down here, this is going to be the enthalpy of formation of ion two oxide. So down here, they ask, calculate the value for second ionization energy of ion C. So let me make it a little bit smaller so that you can see it properly. To find this value, which goes from here to here, I can move back like that and then come until here. This arrow is going to face down, making it negative. That arrow facing down makes it negative. This is already facing down. It remains negative 272. That arrow turns, making it positive 3920. You can see there. This arrow here is also going to turn, making it negative 798, as you can see here. This one here turns, making it positive 141, as you can see there. And this one here turns, making it negative 249. So overall, my C is going to be positive 1567 kilojoules per mole. And that will be the answer. Moving on. Here they say suggest why the second electron affinity of oxygen is positive. For the second electron affinity to occur, O- minus is going to be converted into O2-. minus. That means an electron is going to be added. However, when you're adding an electron that is negatively charged or an already negatively charged ion, there is going to be some repulsion. To overcome that, you need to apply energy. So here I said, because an electron is being added to a negatively charged ion, repulsion between the incoming electron and the already existing electrons needs to be overcome. So this brings us to the end of this paper. Thank you for being with us. Please do not forget to subscribe. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.